Hello and welcome to another Close Read video. My name is Josh I'm, and today I am joined by BRI scholar Tony Williams. Hey Tony. Hey Josh, how you doing? Excited to be on to talk about this important case. Great, yeah, uh, I'm excited too, especially because we are about to release a homework help video on the Establishment Clause. And in that video, we take a look at the history of the Establishment Clause, as well as the application of it um, throughout American history. So in connection to this, we decided here to take a look at the case of Engel v. Vitale, one of the more important Supreme Court Establishment Clause cases. So let's go ahead and dive in. So to start off, Tony, why don't we take a look at the actual wording of the Establishment Clause, as well as um, kind of just, could you give us a background of the Establishment Clause? So why did the founders include it? Were the founders actually unanimous in wanting uh, to include it in the Bill of Rights? Did they have a similar understanding of what establishment meant? Right. Well, there is, those are surprisingly extremely complicated questions, but we'll, we'll you know, we'll try to, uh, you know, simplify it and, and be brief. You know, this idea that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, right? Uh, the words are pretty clear, but they're, you know, they've been debated, uh, you know, at the time and, and right through to until today. On the face of it, I think a couple of very important things. One is Congress shall make no law. So, so we're really talking about a power of Congress. And don't forget the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states until the 14th Amendment, you know, after the Civil War. Uh, and so that's very important. So the founders really thought this was a limitation upon Congress, upon the national government. And make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Uh, you know, even that, you know, th there's something that the, all the founders agreed on, that we should not have a national church, that, you know, we shouldn't have a, a national Baptist or Catholic or, or Jewish, uh, you know, synagogue or church, not Presbyterian, a Congregationalist, what, what have you, because that would breed tyranny, right? It would, it would really violate one's natural right of religious liberty. Okay. Now, the states did have establishments, and, and they were constitutional, because this limits Congress, not the states. But even most of the states themselves were disestablishing, such as Virginia and the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. But there would be uh, some establishments in New England right up through the, you know, 1819, even, even until the 1830s. So let's keep that in mind as a matter of federalism. Was there agreement on this? Well, there was agreement on we shouldn't have a national church, but what did it mean as we dug around deeper? Um, you know, people like Washington, John Adams, John Jay, really, you know, saw a place for government advancing religion uh, or, 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 you know, advocating religion, uh, even if they didn't say we should have a national church. And so, you know, Washington had had days of Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, other kind of re religious um, proclamations. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were sort of on the other side of the argument. And, and you know, Jefferson believed, uh, as well as Madison, that, you know, the government really shouldn't be involved in, in religion at all. Uh, and, and the argument on, on Washington's side uh, was that, you know, the government should, should encourage people to practice their religion privately because this promoted virtue and morality and virtue and morality was the basis of good citizenship and, and Republican government. Uh, and Jefferson and Madison sort of agreed with that, but they said, okay, but we don't need the government to push it or encourage it. Uh, you know, religion is good on its own. So, it, you know, it's a complex subject, uh, but the founders really all agreed that we should not have an official church um, as the very basic understanding of this, but, but it's really meant a lot more than that, as we'll see, especially in modern times. Great, thank you. Now, speaking of the founders, I 
I think I, I recall Jefferson wrote some letter at one point talking about a wall or something like that. Uh, could you just give me a brief rundown of what he talked about? I know that that's really important um, later in history as, as people are trying to interpret the Establishment Clause. Right. Well, well, many of the presidents, the, the early presidents, uh, received letters from various denominations. And, and as a matter of courtesy, presidential courtesy, they, they wrote back to them, encouraging them in, in their, you know, success of, of uh, you know, their churches and so forth. And, and Washington did, did this to almost every, you know, denomination. Uh, and then Jefferson did it as well. And, and he wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptists, uh, where he... Uh, acknowledged that there were state establishments, but uh, he wrote that he believed that there was a quote unquote wall of separation between uh, church and state, between you know government and, and religion. Uh, and this would later on uh, be used, uh, this, this letter uh, that Jefferson wrote as the basis for you know, constitutional doctrine uh, guiding Supreme Court decisions, especially in the second half of the 20th century. So, so this letter to the Danbury Baptist, very important. You know, the students uh, should read it as part of studying uh, this um, topic. Great. So let's go ahead and dive into the actual case here. So the guiding constitutional question is what should the relationship between church and state be? As you mentioned, Jefferson talks about that wall of separation. It's obvious that the founders weren't necessarily in agreement. And of course, Americans throughout history have also not necessarily been in agreement on that. So could you give us a quick rundown of the background of this case? Yeah, the case takes place uh, because students in the state of New York, uh, school said a prayer, okay? And students were uh, invited uh, to participate uh, in that prayer in their schools, in their classrooms, maybe like in, in homeroom, for example, uh, to start the day. Uh, and uh, they said, and, and actually uh, can, can read the prayer really quickly. Uh, it said, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. So on the face of it, you know, I would say uh, that that prayer is a, is a pretty non-sectarian, non-denominational prayer, uh, by and large, one might say, insofar as prayer in school can be innocuous. You know, it's a pretty innocuous prayer. You know, they're just asking God for, for blessings on their teachers and their parents and, and themselves. Uh, and, and I think it's important to note as well that, that the prayer was voluntary, that, that you could be excused. If, if you, your family had some objection to it, the parents didn't want their, their children saying it uh, in the classrooms, um, they, they could be excused. So it's a, it's a non-denominational prayer. It's also not mandatory. Okay, it's voluntary. So, so I think those two things are important to keep in mind. However, you know, on the other hand, it's still a prayer in school. All right, and, and one might wonder uh, whether school should be uh, in, in the business of prayer. Of course, you know, Americans are, are still maybe divided on that question. Uh, but, uh, you know, those are, are roughly the two sides. One says this encourages the students to, to take a moment, reflect, uh, you know, uh, on, on some larger things, maybe ask God for blessings. Others say, well, you know, Prayer has no place in schools. Uh, so those are roughly the, the two sides that are lining up here. Great. So we've got here some expert uh, excerpts from the actual decision. Now the court's going to rule um, that the, the prayer is unconstitutional, that it's a violation of the establishment clause. I believe it's a six to one decision. Um, so here we have Justice Black, he wrote the majority opinion, and he's going to um, uh, talk about kind of the nature of prayer here. And I know you, you had mentioned it's, it seems pretty non-denominational on the face of it, but what does Justice Black have to say about that? 
Yeah, Justice Black uh, basically says it violates the the Establishment Clause, okay, that it's basically a, a religious activity, it's basically an endorsing re re religion, uh, the purpose is not a secular one uh, to, let's say, promote, you know, virtue among the students and, and get them, you know, to behave in school or, or what have you, but, but really has a religious purpose. And so, uh, and, and I think we need to, to remember that you know, because of the 14th Amendment, now this First Amendment Establishment Clause is applied to the states and to local governments. Uh, and because public schools are an entity uh, of that government, uh, the Bill of Rights now applies to them, this Establishment Clause. Uh, and uh, what Black is saying is that this violates the Establishment Clause because, uh, you know, it violates what Jefferson, and he actually even, um, you know, refers to to the Danbury Baptist letter, which was used in the Everson case in, in 1947. Now, the Everson case was a case whereby the court had to decide whether Catholic schools could receive public funding uh, to bus their students uh, to school. And the court allowed the busing, but then referred to the Danbury Baptist letter and said, well, but there's this wall of separation. Not violated in this case, but that's our standard. And how that relates to this case is Black is going off that standard. He's saying there's a wall of separation between government and religion. And in this case, the school prayer violates that idea of a separation of church and state. It, it, you know, it, it breaks down that wall separating the two and violates the establishment clause because you're uniting, uh, you know, religion and government. Great. Yeah, and then we have here um, another quick quote from him. Uh, you, you kind of alluded at the beginning why the founders created the establishment clause, not wanting a national religion. And here he, he talks about kind of the, I guess the utilitarian side of that, of like why it, why you don't want that in a civil society. And just this idea that uh, it's, it's bad both for religion and the government to have them be connected. Um, could you elaborate a bit on this? Right. Um, it basically, it's almost alluding to, uh, you know, some things that Madison and Jefferson wrote during the debate over the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, because it's basically saying that the civil magistrate or the government should not really be in the business of religion or, or encouraging religion or interfering with religion in any way. And that established religions lead to religious persecution, right? Which which has some basis in why the Establishment Clause was created in the first place. But again, it goes to the uh, question of, you know, did the First Amendment Establishment Clause, was it to prevent a national church, uh, you know, an established religion, or was it broader in its, in its application, such as Jefferson and Madison, you know, Jefferson especially wanted that wall of separation. And so thereby, when you when you tear down that wall of separation, you get persecution, uh, as Black says. Great. Now, of course, the court was not unanimous in this decision. There was one dissent, uh, Justice Stewart. And could you give me a rundown? Why did he disagree with this? Yeah, you know, I think he's taking... Uh, the view that the establishment clause really sort of applies to Congress, right? And, and the idea that the establishment clause prevented a national church or an established national religion. And he's basically saying, I, I just don't see that that's happening here. And even if you admit, uh, you know, even if he admits um, the, the principle of incorporation of the Bill of Rights to the states, He's basically saying that, you know, having having some school children recite this prayer, which seems pretty non-denominational and pretty innocuous, uh, they're sharing in the spiritual heritage of the nation, uh, they're promoting good citizenship and, and good government, uh, and it's it's not really leading to any persecutions. Uh, so, so that's what Stuart is saying, and you can kind of see how they're lining up 
uh, with the differing views of the founders, right? With the majority lining up with more of that Jeffersonian, Madisonian view and Stewart taking more sort of that Washingtonian uh, view uh, of things. Right, yep. And then in, in this next quote, we, we kind of see him going on with that, uh, just talking about how um, kind of similar to what you said with Washington, this promotes morality. Um, it's, it's something that we want to encourage. And Stuart here talks about, we have been encouraging that. Look at all the, the government bodies that, that have had some spiritual um, part of it. We have these chaplains, um, other officers that are involved in, in the government, but yet we accept that. So why can't we accept this school prayer? Um, do you have any other thoughts on this quote? Yeah, I know. I mean, he raises several uh, interesting points about how, you know, the federal government is involved with encouraging religion or at least being involved in religion and in pretty peripheral ways, right? Or that, you know, it's okay for the Congress to, you know, start with a prayer or to, to do that in, in, in the national, you know, military. Um, but also, you know, the court opened with, you know, God save this honorable court, uh, you know, and, and other presidential proclamations, which, you know, such as, uh, you know, Thanksgiving and, and so forth, which, you know, I don't think anyone ever declared, um, you know, uh, Lincoln's uh, Thanksgiving proclamations unconstitutional, for example. But, uh, you know, but, you know, he's appealing to that rich heritage, right, where the, the, the government and religion was tied up in our understanding of Republican self-government and, and a virtuous and moral citizenry, um, as well as what he thinks is, is part and parcel of, of just our history and our institutions. Uh, he says this is a co very common practice, so he doesn't have a particular problem with what's going on in the New York schools. Sure, yeah, and another example that stands out in my mind is on our currency, in God we trust. I think Stewart actually mentions that in his decision. And he says, well, we have that. That's just such a fundamental everyday part of our life. Um, so why do we have that? That seems like Congress is kind of getting involved with religion to some extent. So why can't we have prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, you know, let me say this, you know, if the prayer had been different, right, if it was, uh, you know, a particularly denominational prayer, um, if it were uh, very sectarian, uh, if it were uh, mandatory, uh, if students were sort of coerced into saying it, you know, one, one might take different views, right? Uh, so, you know, in, in looking at all sides of this case, um, you know, even, even Stuart might have had some different views, uh, you know, had the sort of nature of the prayer and compliance with saying the prayer, uh, if, that, if that had been different. Great. So let's go back to our original question. So what are some concluding thoughts that you have and how can, um, how can this case help us address this question? Right. Well, uh, what should the relationship between church and state be? Well, you know, it's complex, right? Uh, we, we, we did settle the issue here and, and we're probably not going to, right? This is a very complex issue. Um, but, you know, I would direct our teachers and our students to BRI resources uh, where they can, uh, you know, sort of dig around in these questions and, and watch the homework help videos and, and look at our various curricula, such as religious liberty, uh, that, that deal with this to to try to to try to draw some conclusions about it. Um, you know, it, it takes examining, studying the Constitution, looking at founding views, uh, looking at the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, looking at the Supreme Court cases. You know, but but I would say this. Uh, you know, I don't think that we should. Um, you know, just completely defer uh, to what the Supreme Court says about this, because you know, citizens. Uh, and the other branches, for example, may have uh, different views on whether students should pray in schools or whether there should be prayer uh, at, a, at a public school football game or at uh, uh, graduation ceremonies or at um, uh, uh, 
other events. So uh, one one could continue to, to grapple with this. You know, I, I, I don't know that the court has really uh, conclusively decided this issue. Um, so uh, it's still uh, very much, I think, up for debate. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for joining us. Again, our primary source close reads come out bi-weekly. Uh, and we also, as I mentioned earlier, have a homework help video coming out on the actual establishment clause. And in that video, we're gonna um, talk a lot about what we discussed here, um, but much more. We're gonna really dive into the history and we're also gonna show um, a lot of different cases and how the establishment clause has been applied. So you can join our conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates on programs, events, and ways to get involved. And finally, we'd love to hear from you. So be sure to comment your thoughts on the video below or get in touch with us on social media. Thanks again for joining.